Okay, welcome. Welcome, Moody students and parents, to our Moving On Up night. All together here tonight, you'll be able to participate in this session with the PSAT as showing behind me. You'll be able to participate in the Moving On Up session, which will involve learning about AP classes, ACC classes, and UT on ramps classes. And you'll also be able to learn about uh, course registration. Will you have in front of you hopefully a flyer that indicates that on the based on your child's last name which session you should attend starting at 6:30, and we would appreciate you following those guidelines so that we can just get everyone served tonight. I'm going to start by introducing myself. I'm Susan Leos, Dean of Instruction here at Bowie High School, and again, we appreciate you all being here tonight. And I have beside me Amy Jo Grant, Mary Jo Grant. I'm so sorry. She is going to be here presenting about PSAT results, how to read those, and what that means on significance for you and your child. Thank you so much, Mary Jo, for being here. No problem. All right. Um, everybody can hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up in the back if you can hear me. Live streaming people, you can hear us too. You can't give me a thumbs up because you're on the computer. So this is our first time live streaming this, which is really cool. For those of you who are here in person, you should have some handouts we had in the back. If you don't have any handouts, that's okay. You don't need to hop up. Just raise your hand. And Amber will bring you some. So if you need some handouts, just raise your hand and Amber will bring those over to you. Just relax and keep your hand up. If you are streaming this online and you don't have handouts, that's okay. We'll make sure all these are available digitally to you as well. So we've got a lot of information to cover tonight and not a ton of time to do it. So forgive me if I talk quickly. If you have questions, jot them down. We'll try to leave a little bit of time at the end so that Amber and I can answer those questions for you. Um, and you can always email us at info at teacher.com if you think of something later on as well. So my name is Mary Jo. I have been with More Than a Teacher for over 10 years now, and I really love what we do. I get very excited to come out to events like this and talk to parents and students about understanding these four reports, especially after the PSAT. For those of you here in the cafeteria, let me know who I'm talking to. Um, you already have a couple hands up if you're new materials, that's okay. If you are here though because you have a freshman, just give your hand like a little bit. Okay, cool. If you have a sophomore, awesome juniors, woohoo, okay, and any seniors. All right, perfect. Um, so this information that I'm gonna be sharing with you tonight is most relevant, of course, for juniors. 11th grade really is go time for the SAT and ACT. So I'm going to spend some extra time talking to juniors about their timing and their plan. But if you have a freshman or a sophomore, I've got some great information for you too. Um, and Amber's got some more handouts. Don't worry, if you still need something, you haven't forgotten it. So we're going to talk about the PSAT score report first. Then we're going to talk about SAT versus ACT. Let you know what the differences are there. And if we have some time, we'll even talk about college admission. So what's the PSAT and why do students take it? What's the big deal? Now, if you're a parent like I am, you're wondering why do we do so many tests? We do a lot. Um, there's end of year exams, there's AP exams, there's a lot of things. There's the TSI. What's the big deal about the PSAT? And the big deal really is what the P stands for. The P stands for preliminary or practice. So the main reason why you take the PSAT is so you know what to expect when you take an SAT later on. The SAT is the test you'll use for college admission, and we don't want you to see it for the first time um, when you're taking that official test. We want you to be familiar with that content, familiar with the timing. So the main reason you take it really is it's a practice test. So relax, it's just a practice. The other reason why um, students are taking it that's important to consider is national merit consideration. Have you guys heard about national merit scholarship before? It's not your yet. Okay, awesome. National Merit is the largest private scholarship corporation in the country. These are not scholarships that are like, here's $500 for books. These are scholarships that are could be a full ride, depending on the college you're looking at. Um, I had a parent who came in and she, her student had earned $130,000 worth of scholarship. Is that a big deal? Absolutely, that's super exciting. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about National Merit tonight though. 
because it goes to less than, less than 1% of students in the nation. It is a very, very competitive competition. The first qualifier for national merit is your junior year PSAT scores. So if you have really outstanding junior year PSAT scores, you may be in the running. I mean, I can answer more questions about that at the end, but I don't want to get stuck down that road. Now, the, another thing you can use PSAT for is for TSI. Your PSAT scores can take the place of TSI for 10th grade students. I'll talk more about the score cutoffs we're looking at for that. Question I get from students this time of year is, what's a good score? Or even worse, they don't ask me what's a good score, they just tell me when I say, how'd you do on the PSAT? I did terrible. Well, what was your score? I don't know. Well, that's not good. So to start answering the question, what's a good score, we need to know what your score is, right? So get familiar with that. The other thing is what's a good score is gonna be different for each student. Are all of the movie students gonna graduate and go to the same college together? No, right, absolutely not. That would be adorable, right? That would be cool, we could all, it'd make the news. Um, this year, everyone from James Bowie High is going to Texas Tech. They'll all go together and stay in the dorms. That's not how it goes, though, right? You're all applying to different colleges. Some of you want to go out of state. Some of you want to stay really close to home. Some students aren't ready to start, and they might do a gap year. So it's a different plan for everybody. So what's a good score it depends on you, and it depends on where you want to go. So we have to start with the end in mind. We have to start by thinking about what colleges and universities you're interested in. That'll help us answer that question. So we already spent some time, we're going to talk about next steps, SAT and ACT. We'll get there in just a bit. So first thing is you do need to be able to log into your College Board account and see your scores. Have any of you already seen your PSAT scores? Yes, awesome. Awesome, if you haven't done that yet, they're available. You log into your College Board site, it's collegeboardstudent.org, and there's some prompts that you can follow. You'll have to use the same email address that you used when you signed up, when you took the PSAT. So some students are like, I have no idea what email address that was. That's okay. You can contact your counselor, and they can get you pointed in the right direction, so you can find out how to access those scores. You need to get that information. There is a paper score report, you should be getting that probably in the next couple of weeks at some point. I don't really like the paper score report, to be honest with you. The digital score report has much more data and is super user friendly. So I would encourage you to get access to that digital score report, get comfortable with that. We're gonna talk about what that looks like on the next slide. If you can't access your PSAT scores, get that figured out with your counselor ASAP. Okay, so on the screen right now, I have a sample score report. Hopefully you can see it. Um, the first thing you see at the top, it says your total score. What's a perfect score on the SAT? Anybody know? 1600, I heard some folks shout out, okay. Perfect score on the PSAT is what? 1520, what's up with that? Right, there's this 80 point difference. What's going on there? College Board says that the SAT is about 80 points harder than the PSAT. We don't see that. If we're looking at both practice tests, one doesn't look much harder than the other. But the SAT is longer. It takes a little bit more time and it has more questions on it. What we see is that the total score you got on your PSAT is representative of how you would do on an SAT if you took it the same day. So this is really, really good data. If you're wondering what you need to do, do you need to convert your score, you don't. How you put on the PSAT shows you how you would do on an SAT. Now, under that total score, there's something that I really don't like. It says your percentile. It says what percentile the student's in. That means how you compare to other students who took the PSAT. If you're ever in a school when PSAT scores are delivered, and I have been, this is what happens. You give out the scores and students do this. They want to see how they did compared to everybody sitting next to them. Is that helpful? No. It's really not because like we already said, are they all going to the same college? No. So somebody could be really proud of their 1090 and they should be, and somebody else could be really needing to do some work on their 1300, right? So you don't need to compare your scores to each other. 
You need to figure out where you want to go and compare yourself to that. It's a lot more helpful. So I really don't like the percentiles there. Also, sometimes that's based on a sample percentile, which means it's not comparing you just to other students in Texas or other students in the nation. They've taken a few schools, a few high schools in the nation, and they're comparing you to those couple schools. Does that sound relevant to you? Does that sound useful? No. That's not that helpful. So I want you to look at these numbers. These numbers are more helpful that we look at down below. So your total score is based on two sections. Evidence-based reading and writing. That's sometimes called the EBRW. I'm going to call it the verbal score. Okay, guys, don't turn me into college board. College board doesn't like to call it that, but that's what I call it because that's what it used to be called. And because that's what it is. So the verbal side is your reading and your writing and language. The other side is math. So you have four sections. Evidence-based reading looks like reading comprehension. Your students seen this since about third grade. You read a passage and you answer questions. Then you have a section called write. Did any of you students, did you write an essay when you took the PSAT? You did not. There's no essay. The writing is, it should be called grammar. It's grammar rules and editing. That's what you have to do in that section. Then you have a math section with math with calculator and math with no calculator. Those are your section scores you see here. This student got a 430 on the EBRW and a 530 on that. Below that, you have your test scores. And what this shows us in the test scores is it shows us where your strengths kind of lie. On that verbal side, did you do better on the reading or did you do better on the writing? Um, when I'm looking at a scoreboard, this is really good data for me. The test scores are also what's used to determine national merit eligibility. Um, so those are the scores that they look at for that. For national merit, uh, it's weighted a little differently. We said there's four sections that get turned into two sections, right? You have verbal and math for the SAT. For PSAT, you have reading is worth one third, writing and language is worth one third, and math is worth one third. So it's a little bit different when you're talking about national merit. Um, it's just a little bit different that's only relevant for a couple students who are interested in that. And again, I can field more questions about that later on. Some other things before we move away from the score report is the college readiness benchmark. You're going to hear that terminology a lot, and that's a good goal for a lot of students. Make sure you're hitting that college readiness benchmark. When you're looking at your score report, you see a green, yellow, red under each section. We like green, yellow, red because we know what those colors mean. Um, most of you do. Some people I saw driving on their way here did not know what those colors mean. They were a little confused about green, yellow, and red. Usually, green means what? Go. Yellow means caution. And red means stop. Okay, so for purposes of college board, green means college ready. So if you're in the green, you've already hit that college readiness benchmark. If you're in the yellow, you're not there yet, but with some work you will be. If you're in the red, you should give up. No, not at all. That was a trick. If you're in the red, there's some other things that you're going to need to work on to get closer to college ready. I don't love the green, yellow, red because I think it's a little bit oversimplified. For some students, they may already be in the green, but they need to continue working harder. So I don't want you to see that and be like, check, mission accomplished, I'm college ready. Because if you're applying to a school like Rice, do you need college ready minimum? You need much higher than that. Okay? So again, start with the end in mind. Think about the college that you want to go to when you're determining if your score is what you need it to be. So a little bit more information about national merit. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but so you know what the cutoff score was last year. Looking at those three test scores, they take each test score multiplied by two. So reading times two, writing language times two, and math times two. They add those together, that's your selection index. A perfect selection index would be a 228. That's a student who missed zero questions on the test. They exist, guys, but they're really rare. Don't worry about that. They're rare breed. The National Merit Selection Index score for Texas last year was 221. What does that mean? That, mean that, student, that means that student missed fewer than about three questions um, for, for each section on the test. So when I say it's a very competitive competition, that's not to make you feel discouraged. That's just to let you know it's very tough to get those kind of scores. That's why we make a big deal about students who earn them. 
That's why we give them a lot of kudos and a lot of celebration. So looking a little bit more deeply at your score report here, we talked about test scores. We talked about the green, yellow, red. There's something called cross test scores. These can be used to determine AP potential according to college board. I don't look at these. They're not that helpful for me. You're not going to see any big surprises there. If your student usually does well on math, guess what? They're going to have high math cross test scores. They usually do really well in English. They're going to do well there. The reason for this is to encourage you to take more AP classes. Why does college board care if you take AP classes? Because they own AP exams, guys. It's the same company. The same company that owns the PSAT, the SAT, they also own AP exams and the subject tests. So they're going to continue selling more services to you. Um, don't be discouraged by that, but just understand they have their own agenda too. But the subscores on your score report, this is good information. And I want you to look at that when you're looking at that score report. This will tell you not just you need to get better at math, that can be discouraging for a student. You did bad at math, get better, good luck, man. That's not helpful, right? But they'll tell you more specifically, you need to work on algebra. Then even more specifically, you need to work on linear equations. Is that something you can do? Yeah. Right, suddenly it's a lot more achievable to do better if you know what specific skills you need to focus on. There's a really great resource to do this called Khan Academy. How many of you students, have you guys heard of Khan Academy? Yeah, awesome. I love Khan Academy. It's a great tool. Khan Academy is officially partnered with College Board. This means when you take your PSAT scores, you're on your College Board account, you can link to Khan. They input your PSAT scores and give you specialized feedback. They give you practice questions specific to your skill set. So Khan Academy is great for skill building. A couple things to keep in mind for Khan Academy. If you are not self-motivated, is an app the best way to practice? Probably not, right? Um, a lot of students will tell me, yeah, I have that on my phone, but I haven't even opened it one time. That's not useful. What they saw in Khan Academy is it takes about 20 hours of practice for a student to improve their score by on average 115 points. Do you want 115 points? Yeah, right? If you're looking at that score now and you're adding 100 points to it, you're like, that would put me in a better position. Budget at least 20 hours to get better then. What that means is that means when a student comes to me and they say, I used Khan Academy and it didn't work for me. I say, well, how much time did you spend? I spent about two or three hours on there. That's not going to do it. Another thing College Board taught us is they saw the most popular time for students to log into Khan Academy. Guess when it was? The night before. <laughs> the night before the official test. Um, that's when all of the well-meaning students were like, all right, it's time to practice. And some of you, clever students, you're thinking, okay, you said 20 hours. You said the night before, I can make this work. Don't do that. Don't do that. What we find at More Than a Teacher is that about a month or a month and a half is the perfect sweet spot for you when it comes to getting ready. Okay? If you start now and you're not testing until June, that's too much. Most students don't have the stamina to prep for that long. But if you start the day before or even the week before, you're cramming things into your memory that won't be able to stay there. You'll get nervous on the test day and all of that stuff is gonna flush out. So plan for about a month or a month and a half. That's how our classes are structured. They start about a month from an official test date and lead right up to it for that very reason. So that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about prepping. Okay, I'm gonna move away from PSAT and talk about SAT and ACT. In your handouts, you have a chart that looks like this or that'll be available digitally online for you folks as well. I'm not going to read this to you. You can take your time and read through it. I am going to give you some basics. But first, I'm going to tell you some myths, some myths and urban legends about why you should take one test over the other. Um, the one you probably heard the most common is that ACT is good for STEM students. If you like science and technology and math, you should consider the ACT. The reason for that is there's a science section on the ACT that's not part of the PSAT or SAT. However, that science section is very reading heavy, so that's a bit of a myth. I've seen students who love science and hate that science section. So the best thing to do is to take a practice test. Take a practice ACT, we can compare that to your SAT, apples to apples, and see which one is the better test for you. And that's what the back of the sheet has. It has a chart where you can compare that. So 
So when you hear SAT and ACT, I want you to think Pepsi and Coke. These are two competing companies that do exactly the same thing. One is not the easier test, one is not the better test. They're very, very similar, in fact. They're testing the same content, they're just different styles. Many students do the same on both, and that's okay. You don't have to take both, figure out which one you want to take, and take that one at least twice as a junior. Make sense? You guys are with me so far? All right, awesome. Okay, the other handout I want to point you towards has all of the official test dates for this year. If you have a junior, those of you who raised your hand, you have a junior, these are really important for you. Junior year, we want you to take the SAT or ACT at least twice. Can you test as a senior? Yes. When are you going to start applying, though? It may be the summer before senior year. It might be when you start applying. So we want you to be done with your testing, mostly junior year. Get that wrapped up. Should you do it in the fall or the spring? That depends on you. If you're in a lot of extracurriculars that are busy in the fall, you may want to look at spring. Vice versa, right? Another thing to consider is that the SAT and the ACT are very heavy in Algebra 2. So if you haven't had Algebra 2 yet and you're a junior, you're going to need that. Excuse me. If you have Algebra 2 as a sophomore, you can take the SAT early in junior year. You're ready. You have the math that you need. So keep that in mind as you're timing things out. Um, also, pay attention to deadlines. Sign up on time. Pay attention to the optional essays. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. They're going to ask you if you want to take the optional essay. You do. When something's optional, what should you do? Do it. Do the optional thing. <clears throat> The other thing is, they're going to ask you if you want to send your scores. Oh, that was, I'm like a jazz singer now, guys. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, they're going to ask you if you want to automatically send your scores, and you do. Pick four schools and automatically send your scores, it's okay. They know you're going to maybe have one bad test day, that's all right. They're looking for reasons to bring you in, not reasons to keep you out. So be confident, go ahead and send your scores to at least four schools. Okay, the last sheet that you have has some information about assured admission and assured scholarships at various colleges. <clears throat> this is really exciting because there's a lot of money out there for good scores. Take a look and help goal set based on how much money you want, based on where you want to go to school. This is really good information there to get you started on that search. The test should not be emotional. The tests don't have feelings. The tests are really straightforward and they're easy to prepare for if you know what to expect. So what we want to do by giving you this information tonight and by, if you choose to enroll in a class, if you choose to do Khan Academy or meet with some friends, what we want to do is not change who you are. It's not learn how to game the test. Sometimes people say that, they say they want to game it. It's not about that. It's about preparing. I'm not emotional, I'm just losing memory, sorry guys. <laughs> it's about preparing and doing your best though. I've yet to meet a student who can't improve. Typical point improvement that we see is about 100 to 200 points. That's what Khan Academy saw too, right? They saw 20 hours of work. So that's what you can expect to see if you're willing to put in the work. If you have questions about SAT, ACT, or PSAT, stick around, but I'm going to wrap up at that. Um, if you want to email us, we can set up a free score consultation and meet with people with your PSAT scores in more detail. I'm also going to be back on campus on January 24th during lunch. So students, if you print out your score report and you come have lunch with me, bring a brown bag lunch, sit down with me in the counseling office, and I'll get your score report ready and give you feedback. And it's free. You don't have to sign up for anything at all. Information should be free. We want you to feel empowered. So come and take a listen to that. Um, if you have any questions, we're happy to help. Thank you guys so much for your patience. Thank you very much, thank you so much. And I will actually do a little quick segue here. April 9th, which is a Tuesday, all juniors, um, you will be taking the SAT here at Dewey. Um, this is some new information, we'll be putting it out to everyone, but all juniors, you'll be automatically registered and you will be taking the SAT here on campus for April 9th. Now for transition, I'll segue again to a transition piece. 
If your child's last name starts with A through K, you will begin the next session at 6.30 here in the cafeteria. If your child's last name begins with L through Z, you will need to move to the band hall because your first session will be on graduation requirements and our course registration process that's coming up really Thank you so much for your attendance at the PSAT session. We'll see you in a few seconds.